Good morning, uh, excuse me, afternoon, and welcome to Cancer Center Grand Rounds. Uh, today we're back to the, the old format. Last week we had the, the uh, director of the FDA uh, here. Today we have people um, who are going to represent uh, two of our important programs and priorities at Yale Cancer Center. The first we're going to hear from Gary Kupfer. Gary heads our pediatric hematology oncology program. Uh, he's also someone uh, who has done great work in Fanconi's anemia and has thought a lot about DNA repair and how DNA repairs damage from a number of different insults. And today he'll be talking to us about tales of genomic instability. Following that, we'll hear from Ann Chang. Ann is an assistant professor of medicine. Uh, she is our uh, chief uh, medical officer for the network and our chief network officer for the Smilo Cancer Hospital. And she'll be talking to us about the Emotional Distress Initiative um, and a uh, report of quality improvement in the Smilo care centers. So it's with great pleasure that we introduce Dr. Kupfer. Thank you. Good to be here today. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about what's going on in my lab. And even though uh, this is maybe probably the second occasion uh, a lot of you will have heard about Fanconi anemia, uh, the first being during medical school, and I guess the second time is going to be today, I'm going to try to show you a little bit about how the biology of a rare genetic disease can still have impact more broadly uh, in medical oncology. And indeed, uh, some of recent ventures that we have going on in my research group, I hope will have impact not just in pediatrics, but also in the adult uh, oncology world. And indeed, Fanconi does have uh, importance in the general uh, oncology world, which I'll hope to uh, show you here in the next few minutes. Uh, and basically, we worry about how DNA damage engenders oncogenesis and how you repair that DNA. And as is often the case in uh, biology, we go to uh, rare genetic diseases, and hopefully these are actually familiar to you, uh, including Fanconi up here at the top. And I put it up there at the top for a few reasons, obviously, because I work on it. But also, it happens to be the most common reason uh, for uh, the most common genetic disease for bone marrow failure, which is the predecessor for the development of myeloid leukemia, to which patients who are born with Fanconi are predisposed. Uh, you'll have uh, just a little bit of background on Fanconi, and uh, first described in uh, the 20th century by a very astute Italian Swiss uh, hematologist who noticed a, a family of three kids with bone marrow failure, congenital defects, and then most notably going on to get myeloid leukemia. And indeed, if these patients are lucky enough to make it to adulthood, they get a whole host of different solid tumors as well, head and neck, breast, gut, and GYN. So these patients actually look kind of unique. They, uh, those, uh, those of us who spend more time with these patients actually can pick them out the, sa the same way, I think, the the broader population can pick out a patient with Down syndrome. Uh, these kids actually have a uh, sort of typical face, but even more so, they can have uh, these, dismor uh, these disfigured hands. These are kids who can be born without thumbs or simply malformed thumbs or the radius of their forearm. And here, this particular kid does not have a radius and he doesn't have a bony thumb. That's sort of the classic, but what about the biology? Um, this is sort of the classic biology of Fanconi, and these are patients who exhibit chromosomal breakage. You can actually order this test in EPIC, and uh, you actually expose lymphocytes from patients, and they'll actually expose them to interstrand crosslink agents, uh, and they'll actually exhibit uh, a quantifiable increase in chromosomal aberrations. You can actually take their cells as well and incubate them in cell culture and compare them to wild-type cells. Am I? Yeah, here you go. So you can compare the, hyper, the sensitivity curves in the mutant cells versus wild-type cells and demonstrate a marked hypersensitivity. And this hypersensitivity is really to a very narrow range of DNA damaging agents, interstrand crosslinkers like mitomycin C and cisplatin. Now, uh, clinically, these patients uh, first come to our attention a lot of times because of this, and that's bone marrow failure, where there's really a complete paucity of the different uh, blood elements uh, producing red cells, platelets, and white cells. 
And it's really this sort of ominous picture that we want to be able to prevent uh, through some means. Uh, the means in the tw early 21st century continues to be bone marrow transplant. Uh, however, if you do a transplant on a little kid like this, you uh, engender a lot of late effects. Uh, however, you don't want to do it too uh, much later after this kid's grown up a little bit because you could miss the window during which time these patients go on to get myeloid leukemia. So these are very challenging patients to take care of. Even worse, because of this hypersensitivity curve I told you about before, uh, if you try to treat a patient like this with conventional chemotherapy, once they've gotten myeloid leukemia, they're going to literally fall apart and have life-threatening toxicity from the uh, DNA damage engendered by chemotherapy. So what about the background and biology of Fanconi? Well, you can break it down, the, the Fanconi pathway biochemically, in an upstream core complex, a, uh, an ID complex here, and a downstream set of effectors. Now, uh, it turns out that there are 16 genes uh, when, which, when mutated in Fanconi, lead to the disease. Really, what's, I think, the most cool thing, one of the cool things uh, that I think uh, will be the first point that's most will be appealing to the medical oncology crowd is the fact that five of Fanconi genes, five discrete Fanconi genes here in blue, are actually familial breast cancer genes. So in the 20 years that I've been working in Fanconi, we've gone from backwater, obscure genetic disease of cancer susceptibility all the way to mainstream. Uh, the biology of Fanconi is tied up in breast cancer biology. And in fact, uh, patient, uh, one of the most severely affected types of Fanconi subtypes is, are the BRCA2 homozygotes. Patients which, when mutated in both alleles of BRCA2, have severe, uh, severely affected Fanconi anemia phenotype. Um, the other thing I would point out is that we focus in my lab a lot on this mid-range mid complex, the ID complex, because this upstream complex uh, actually confers a, mon a single ubiquitin on each molecule here, resulting in focus formation in response to DNA damage. This is kind of a major readout in my lab and one which I'll come back to over and over again. Uh, but essentially, these are the main players down here in homologous recombinatorial repair to repair that interstrand crosslink that I've referred to. Now, what is going on? So, it's well known that this pathway interdigitates with DNA and, uh, and causes homologous recombination. But we were actually interested in my lab, and I'm going to kind of take you into a segue into thinking more about RNA. And I think the idea of RNA will come back uh, to be more clinically relevant here in a minute. But uh, a couple of reasons why. We know that BRCA1, for example, is involved in RNA metabolism, and BRCA1 and BRCA2 are intimately part of, DNA, of Fanconi biology. Uh, many important Fanconi proteins bind to DNA, which, of course, uh, it would be reasonable that uh, if they could also bind to RNA as well. And knockdown of different splicing factors that manipulate RNA do cause genomic instability. And in fact, the DNA-RNA hybrid resembles a D-loop, which is actually a homologous recombination intermediate. And then finally, a lot of the RNA diseases, including diamond black fan, Schwachmann diamond, dyskeratosis congenita, again, I hope maybe you've heard at least once in your life back in medical school uh, or other places, uh, actually resemble phenotypically the Fanconi phenotype. I don't know why this keeps going black. So anyway, we wanted to uh, actually take a peek at why if the, any of these Fanconi proteins could actually bind RNA the same way they bind DNA. And in fact, these, oligo, uh, these oligomers of RNA actually bind quite nicely to uh, Fanconi proteins. And this is just a simple Western blot, taking RNA homopolymers and dipping them into uh, extracts from either these wild-type wild cells here in the middle or Fanconi mutants here or deletion mutants. And you can see there's actually very nice pull down of Fanconi proteins uh, with RNA. Now, what about that, that observation? Well, we know, go, going back to our loops, we know that RNA, our, our loops are actually RNA DNA, DNA hybrids, which resemble these D loops, which are repair intermediates. And these R loops form at G rich sequences, and these are actually sources of genomic instability. Why is, I don't know why this is happening. What am I doing wrong here? All right. Well, anyway, 
Um, we could actually make these R loops or we can make D loops and, and test whether in vitro uh, made proteins could actually bind uh, to these structures. And maybe if you have any recollection of, of uh, DNA repair lectures in the past, you know that these D loops are the homologous recombination intermediate resembling the R loop in which we've replaced the DNA with RNA. And in fact, these Fanconi proteins bind quite well uh, to these various structures, if it was an RNA structure or a DNA structure. So these R loops are actually interchangeable with D loops, yet these are genomically unstable. Now, let's go back to the idea of R loops and splicing factors, and we know that Fanconi anemia, in a way, can be thought of as amylodysplastic syndrome because this aplastic anemia, bone marrow failure phenotype, is actually for sure a precursor to AML, and the vast majority of Fanconi patients will indeed go on to get AML uh, after they present with bone marrow failure. So what about MDS? Uh, well, we know that there's lots of mutations and numerous splicing factors, and that there's actually been a, one of the Fanconi genes has been known, uh, shown to have mutations observed in adult uh, MDS. And still further work by Lee and Manley have shown that knockdown of splicing factors will cause genomic instability. So we wanted to take a little closer look at the relationship between splicing factors and Fanconi. And indeed, when we do a knockdown experiment to get down to this particular splicing factor, SF2, we actually can impair the ubiquitination of, fan of FANC-D2. Now remember that FANC-D2 ubiquitination, and you can see this doublet occurring here, is actually a central biochemical marker for normal Fanconi function. And when you get rid of the splicing factor, you lose that ubiquitination, so that doublet goes away. But not only that, you get rid of the splicing factor and you create interstrand cross-link hypersensitivity. Again, that's kind of a hallmark of Fanconi. So these cells, when they lose splicing factors, act like Fanconi cells. And in fact, this particular splicing factor, SF2, binds to FANC-D2 so that when we pull down the wild-type FANC-D2 protein, we pull down splicing factor, a, an observation that we could not duplicate in a mutant Fanconi D2 protein here. In fact, when we looked at a couple of other splicing factors, we noticed a Fanconi phenotype as well. SC35 is actually one of the most commonly mutated uh, splicing factors in myelodysplasia. And when we knocked out that splicing factor, we actually severely impaired the ubiquitination of FANC-D2. And in fact, we could demonstrate that SC35 knockdown also created a hypersensitivity survival curve. Again, here you got two splicing factors which are demonstrating a Fanconi phenotype when removed from the extract. Whereas perhaps here is a control splicing factor which continues to show resistant phenotype even when knocked down. Now, I don't know if this shows how well this shows up, but another readout for Fanconi function is actually a look at FANC D2 foci formation. And you can see here that after DNA damage, these are untransfected, this is a control, and then this is another splicing factor, but in these three cases, FANC D2 forms these nice little foci. But when we knock down these two splicing factors, foci go away completely. Even more intriguingly, we wanted to take a look at SC35 and mutations which occur in MDS. And these are patient-derived MDS mutations in SC35. And when we express these with the help of Stephanie Helene, sorry about that, we can actually demonstrate uh, here, here, and here. Take a look at FANC-D2 uh, ubiquitination. It's actually suppressed by the expression of those particular point mutants. So we believe that there's actually a link between adult myelodysplasia and the biology of Fanconi. Now what about another readout for uh, in vivo for uh, genomic instability in R loops? Well, remember we believe that that R loop is the source of genomic instability in the case of these splicing factor defects and in Fanconi. And when we take a look at it, we know that splicing factors form at GC-rich regions. So when we just take a look at, it, at the actin gene here, for example, at this C-rich region, uh, we can, if there are R loops actually there in vivo, they would be converted to Ts. You can see here they're just Cs here on the sequencing gel. But if we take a look at 
a Fanconi mutant cell, you see these little red peaks show up. And that's a conversion of C's to T's which show up at R loops. So there are actually more R loops showing up in Fanconi mutant cells as a source of genomic instability. And this is not advancing. Sorry about that. To look at a little bit larger scale, we did uh, exomic sequencing of mutant Fanconi cells and wild type Fanconi cells. And you can just see here in the pink that we see a vast increase in the numbers of R loops found in a deletion mutant cell uh, of Fanconi cells and a, uh, another Fank D2 mutation cell line uh, with a very, very small number of them showing up in the wild type cell. There are naturally occurring R loops at promoters, so we expect to see those in common to all three, but the vast majority of our additional R loops are showing up in these mutant cells. So we believe that R loops are actually a source of genomic instability in Fanconi cells and indeed in myelodysplasia. And just one other way we can show it is simply by immunoprecipitation. You can see here and here all this extra RNA coming down, RNA-DNA hybrids coming down with an RNA-DNA hybrid, whereas in the wild type cells, very little of that is coming down. So we believe that actually Fanconi proteins are actually suppressing the formations of these aberrant RNA structures here in red, which are actually looping around, just hanging out in the breeze, enter into uh, hybridization with DNA and causing genomic instability. And I guess I would add it to the number of different functions that we've been able to identify for Fanconi anemia proteins, including the suppression of transcription while repair would then be allowed to, uh, uh, to, get, to be underway. So let me bring it back to general oncology once again. And we've done, I've tried to explain a little bit about how Fanconi has this relationship with myelodysplasia. Uh, but we believe that there's an important link between Fanconi and sporadic cancers. It's actually well known that sporadic uh, mutations are actually found in a wide array of different cancers, pancreas, lung, squamous cell, AML. And again, I'll just reiterate, these are patients who do not have Fanconi. These are your average run-of-the-mill patients in medical oncology. Uh, and don't forget that Fanconi biology is tied up in BRCA tumors as well. The BRCA2 gene, for example, is a Fanconi gene, and BRCA1 biology is tied up in Fanconi biology as well. And don't forget this emerging story of PARP inhibitors being used in, uh, in the clinical setting as well in the BRCA mutant tumors. So we're very interested to see if this backwater rare genetic disease can even be further tied into uh, the adult world of cancer. And uh, for many of you who've been attending the Yale Personalized Medicine Tumor Board, you know by now, I hope, uh, that uh, Fanconi genes have started to loom rather large. Um, at last count, uh, with the help of Jeff Sklar and Paul Eder, we know, I know pretty sure that believe that at least 52 exomes have been sequenced and presented at tumor board, and at least four of those tumors have had uh, predicted pathogenic Fanconi mutations uh, in these three particular Fanconi genes. Again, deleterious by prediction. And we've actually embarked on a uh, screening strategy to try to, number one, confirm that uh, keep missing that. Well, anyway, let me just take one step back here. Uh, because of this uh, observation that these Fanconi mutations are showing up here on our very doorstep, we wanted to try to identify a strategy where we could actually uh, take advantage of that in the clinical setting. So we actually set up a synthetic lethal screen to see if we could find genes which, when targeted, would actually lead to uh, enhancement of cell kill in mutant Fanconi cells and, indeed, interchangeably, mutant tumor cells, mutant for Fanconi genes. So we actually used a uh, high throughput synthetic lethal screen to identify sets of genes which when knocked out, which would lead to uh, cell death in the synthetic lethal screen. We also have a Fanconi suppressor screen as well. And so we could actually identify genes which when knocked down uh, caused an enhancement of of uh, mutant cell, uh, cell death, and this is just showing that PLK1, for example, is far outside the uh, range of uh, no effects. So PLK1 knockdown caused higher toxicity in Fanconi mutant cells. And we were able to identify several pathways 
which when targeted in this fashion could actually lead to enhancement of cell death in cells that are mutant for Fanconi genes, including the proteasome, transcriptional processing, mitotic regulation, and broadly through the cell cycle. And actually interesting genes to us were those that could actually be immediately targeted, including PLK1, we won the proteasome, and RAN. Uh, interestingly, PARP did not show up in any of our screen. So I think it's important to note for those of us who are using PARP inhibitors in the clinic that they're probably not going to be broadly uh, useful for all Fanconi genes, but probably restricted to BRCA2 and perhaps BRCA1. Uh, we, just as a sidelight, we continue to search for ways to target uh, Fanco Fanconi patients by suppressing the Fanconi phenotype and have uncovered a bunch of interesting genes that we believe could help ameliorate the Fanconi phenotype as well. So what we are going to embark on now is to actually use a couple of mouse models in Fanconi, including the FANC-D2 knockout and the FANC-C knockout. The D2 knockout actually uh, results in a whole host of different tumors, which we want to be able to transplant from these mice into wild-type backgrounds and then treat these patient, treat these patient mice with interstrand crosslinkers, plus the targeted therapies we identified through the synthetic lethal screen I just showed you. And so in a, uh, what we want to do uh, in collaboration with Paul Eater uh, is to kind of create a Fanconi mutant tumor pipeline, verify functional mutations, uh, express the mutations in cells, test for crosslink sensitivity, and read out through FANC-D2 ubiquitination and then use the mice to actually show proof of principle with the crosslinker and these targeted therapies and eventually try to have our own clinical trial here at Yale and elsewhere that will allow us to bring together the Fanconi biology and the synthetic lethal screen readout uh, for a clinical trial. So this is just a list of people who uh, have contributed to the work in my lab over here, including the people in yellow who are currently there and people here in pink who are now gone from my lab. And most importantly, I just want to mention all these people listed here, and I apologize if I've left them out, anybody out, but uh, I think this list is amazing. I've been here for seven years, and I just continue to be amazed at the wealth of uh, intellectual uh, interaction which goes on here. And this is just a probably, I think this is as complete a list as I could make without running over the slide uh, of people that we have active uh, collaborations going on here at Yale. So thanks very much.